and thank you so much for joining us. I am so delighted that my friend William Henry is here today. William Henry is an investigative mythologist, art historian, and TV presenter. He is the host of Ascension Keepers and Morph on Gaia TV. He's also an internationally recognized authority on human spiritual potential, transformation, and ascension. Thank you so much for joining us, William. I'm thrilled to be here, Suzanne. Thank you. And I'm such a big fan of your work. I've been following you on Gaia TV, and I love your books and workshops. So thank you so thank much you. for all you're doing to bless humanity with this remarkable information about transformation and ascension. Thank you. It's, uh, it's the most important topic, the most important place all of us can put our energy right now. And ultimately it's the choices that we're making right now about uh, elevating our consciousness and putting ourselves on that ascension path are, are not just going to have huge ramifications for our individual lives, but more importantly, for the collective soul of humanity. And I really like in your presentations how you bring forth about how the ancient stories of ascension relate to what's unfolding right here and now. Can you expand on that? Yeah, well, thank you. And thank you for picking up on that, because I think that is a really important or an, a, a really important contribution that I've been making in, in this ascension field. And I've, I've been researching this area for 20 years. I can't believe I've been writing about uh, ascension and human transformation since 2002. But, but here we are. And what I feel is really important for people to grasp is that ascension isn't something that has recently emerged as a, as a concept or, or as a goal. In other words, it's not something that uh, is channel material from modern new age thinkers, or it's not something that somebody just thought up as a, as a new technique to, to expand your consciousness. It's actually the fundamental spiritual practice of all human history. And what I've discovered in my research, and this is documented on my Gaia TV show, Ascension Keepers, and, and in my books, is that originally humans were, were meant to be on the Ascension path. That, but unfortunately, as history progressed, we started to get some, let's just call it interference. Uh, I mean, what fun is it to have everything automatically accomplished for us, right? I guess we need to have some kind of conflict. We need drama. We need opposition in order to learn to flex our muscles. And this is certainly what's happened in the ascension field that a lot of people today, if you talk about ascension, they'll say, well, yeah, if God wants me to send to ascend, God will send me an invitation. Until then, I'm just going to wait it out because I'm just going to be spontaneously transformed at, at some moment in time. And that's a, that's a valid belief held by a lot of people on this planet. But another school says that you can take it upon yourself to decide, hey, I'm ready to graduate from earth school. I, I've accomplished my mission. I have fulfilled my soul's destiny here. And I'm going to make a conscious choice while living to assure my ascension by thinking about uh, where am I going from here? I mean, I like to say people have health plans, they have family plans, they have holiday plans. My question for everyone, including those listening now is, what's your ascension plan? Where, where did you come from before you came into this 3D material existence on earth right now? What, what are you doing here? And ultimately, when you decide it's time to leave, where are you going? And how are you going to get there? These are fundamental questions that I think we all need to be thinking about and spending uh, our time, energy, and emotion working on in, in our daily existence. And I, I, I like to joke with people. I ask, well, you know, how much time did you spend yesterday on your conscious ascension? Uh, yeah, a couple minutes, 20 minutes, a couple hours. You get the point that for, for a lot of people, until recent times when we've got this huge nudge that has occurred, Working on our ascension plan just was not as important as our holiday plan. Let me put it that way. But that's what's changing right now in our world. And the Essenes certainly had an ascension plan. And thank you so much for translating the Dead Sea Scrolls and the information within about what they did 
to translate their human flesh into celestial flesh for ascension. Right. Uh, that's it's such a, a fascinating area of the work I've been doing is, is recovering the, the inner teachings of, of the Essenes, the, the, prim, the primarily uh, Jewish tribe out of uh, the tribe of mystics out of which Jesus and Mary Magdalene emerged, John the Baptist. Uh, it's uh, a, a group of Ascension scholars, really, who, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, set out to call in a high celestial being who would teach the Essenes how to put on, as they describe in the Dead Sea Scrolls, their, their crown of glory and their robe of unending light. I mean, just think about the, that imagery, your crown of glory, or your halo, mm -hmm. and your robe of un, unending light, your light body, your ascension body. It, what it was really about for the Essenes was not something that you actually acquire when they're talking about the crown and the robe. It's something that we already have that has been covered over by false perceptions by a culture that says, hey, you can't activate your light body and ascend, or just simply by plain old ignorance. But once we start to understand it and, and recognize it and live from the perspective of our divine self, which is what the crown and the robe represents, that's the flip that the Essenes said was absolutely a, the, the most important step in beginning the process of what, what scholars call angelification or human transformation into an angel. The, 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 the swapping or, or transfiguring, if you will, of our earthly flesh for celestial flesh. And if I might say so, Suzanne, uh, this what I just described is today being precisely mocked and mimicked by people like Facebook who now call themselves meta because what the Essenes proposed is that we could transform into a higher state of being, the celestial flesh state of being, and ascend to a higher frequency world they called the New Jerusalem. Well, today in Silicon Valley, they're proposing that what you really want to do is drop your physical flesh and blood body, copy and paste the contents of your brain, which to them is your soul, into a cartoon version of yourself that lives in a black box in Silicon Valley in some quantum computer in a simulated reality created by a quantum computer. And these, as I started to point out back in 2002, the, this is the bifurcation that is happening right now. I mean, back when I was talking about this in 2002, people had no idea what I was talking about. What do you mean we're gonna, there's a bifurcation coming and some of us are gonna merge with AI and turn ourselves into machines and, and live forever in a black box in Silicon Valley. And others of us will decide to, we're gonna, no, we're gonna remain organic, natural, pure human beings. We, we don't, we're gonna not merge any further with AI. We've gone far enough, thank you. This is all great. Love being able to Google stuff. I love being able to order something and have it come instantly. But no, I don't want to merge with your freaking AI and lose my individuality, lose the contents of my brain to control, let you hijack my body and my soul. No, thank you. I'm going to stay right here. That's the, the, the bifurcation. That is the choice that is before us right now. As I said, back when I started talking about this in 2002, people are like, wow, what are you talking about? But now it's clearly right in front of us. And back then, I had always said that the powers that be wanted to affect this merger with AI by 2035. And 20 years ago, 2035 sounded like a long way away. But now it's just 10 years or less, really, because it's not 2035. It's more like 2030 or so is, is, is where they hope this agenda to really take place. And what is transpiring in our world now Everything that is happening in our world right now is about getting people to migrate out of their physical flesh and blood body into their digital technological body. And that is something I, I caution people about gravely. Becoming trapped in the matrix, plugged into the matrix, right? And certainly exactly. your show, Morph, on Gaia TV, you do reveal so much of what's unfolded here in just the last couple of years. In fact, you talked about being implanted with a chip 
And I was stunned at the date that you produced more. If you looked quite a bit younger and I was like, wait a minute, when did he make this? Because he's talking about what's happening now. So truly a visionary, exactly. William. How did you tune into that? Well, I started, I was uh, researching extraterrestrials, uh, reading Zachariah Sitchin and Eric von Doniken and other authors that were looking into the question of whether flesh and blood extraterrestrials had visited us in the ancient past. And I just locked on to or focused on a power garment that they possessed. I, I started noticing in many of these stories that the gods and even the angels would transmit to a human prophet a, a cloak or a garment that, that gave them superpowers. They could heal the sick, they could raise the dead, they could part the waters of the River Jordan, they could ascend in a whirlwind. And I'm like, what is that? <laughs> and, and can I get one of those things, right? <laughs> so I, I track it over many thousands of years as they would pass along this garment from one, one figure to another, showing up in Egyptian texts and in Tibetan texts, Christian texts, uh, Buddhist texts, they all talk about this robe of glory, this robe of light. And so back in 2002, as I was writing my first book about this subject, I first learned about the United States Department of Commerce and their goal to merge four technologies, genetic technology, nanotechnology, neuroscience, and computer technology into one seamless technology aimed at the human skin. And they were literally describing, creating what I interpreted as a technological version of that robe of superpowers. And I'm like, wait a minute, that, that's what they are doing. And so that, that was the impetus for me to start tracking what was happening with transhumanism and AI. And always all along, I was advocating we've got to stay on the organic, natural, pure human path. And I'm thrilled. Uh, people like Greg Braden have now adopted my platform and are out speaking about it. Other people like Greg need to get on this topic now. We have to, their audiences have to engage in this question because if, if, if we stay asleep at the wheel on this, the powers that be will be creating not just a matrix, but so, uh, really a, a trap, I believe, for souls. And that, that's, not, that's not hyperbolic what I'm saying. They are literally trying to take God out of our world, the concept, redefine the, the definition of the word soul, just like they can now redefine the, the definition of fully vaccinated. They can also now, and they are redefining what the word soul is, because to your big tech people, your soul is not the eternal divine aspect of yourself created by God. Your soul is just the accumulation of all those photos you put up on Facebook, Bubba, and all those Instagram posts and your TikTok, TikTok videos and uh, every keystroke that you've ever uh, done on your computer since you switched it on. We, we've recorded all of that. And, and that's your soul. And what you're going to do is you're going to take that soul and you're going to take, take away this body and you're going to create your cartoon version. You're going to go live in, in the virtual world. That, that's their game. That's their game. And to me, again, um, I can't overemphasize what a soul trap that actually is. And so you're talking about a bifurcation then of those who choose the AI path and those who choose the ascension path. And how do you see this bifurcation playing out? Well, I mean, if we were to just stop right where we're at right now uh, and look for examples, you can see what's happening in Germany. Um, people who don't take the, the, the software that is encoded in the COVID vaccine are being segregated. And there, there's talk of camps in, in Australia and even in America. And, and this is, gets pretty extreme when you start talking about saying, look, if, if you're going to remain an organic, unaugmented human, you are now considered unsocial or unfit to be part of the rest of the public because the rest of the public is going the augmented path. The rest of the public will continue to boost uh, what has already been, been injected. And they will then continue to merge with AI, switching from 4G to 5G, 
to 6G radiation as the implants start to come in. Because what will happen is that all of this will eventually go, will break the skin barrier and be within your skin. And then at that point, through their, their, their system of QR codes that virtually every major corporation on this planet is bought into, they're literally going to create an on-off switch for you that will mandate where you can go, what you can do, what you can think, what you can buy. That's called the mark of the beast in the book of Revelation. And this, then what that is, is one step short of worship of the, the image of the beast, which is the, the cyborg antichrist, which is coming. That's the first time I've heard that, the cyborg antichrist. Yeah, because what they're doing, Suzanne, if you look at corporations like uh, Samsung, uh, most people think, oh, Samsung, they make really crappy washers and dryers and, and cell phones that are, have a decent camera in them. That's they also are, are now in the replacement human business. They are creating replacement humans they call neons. They're initially meant for customer service positions. They could replace you. Uh, because you're just an interviewer, you could be programmed. We don't need we don't need a real Suzanne anymore. We can just use your avatar, right? Um, it's the same thing with William Henry. I'm totally replaceable. They can take all my books, all my data, all my articles, everything I've ever done, and create a, a cartoon version, version of myself that might even be able to do a better job than I do, right? And that's what Samsung is is counting on. That they're going to they've got these replacement humans. You can look them up online. They're called neons. They look just like you and I, but they live behind the glass for now, because what's intended is that these avatars that they're creating behind the glass are intended to cross over the glass and take on physicality as actual living beings that you'll, you know, some people will start having sex with them. Some people will use them as, as uh, guardians for their children, uh, chefs, all that. They'll replace most human jobs uh, with these replacement humans. And the thing is, is, is that they're soulless beings unless we allow that your soul is just all that information that is that you've accumulated throughout your life. And that, that gets back to our previous discussion that we have to recognize that this is actually a spiritual war that is unfolding right now. And what is coming next is a high spiritual avatar that will be totally created. I, I really thought Travis Scott was on the path to that. I had been really watching his, his AI uh, endorsed video or AI infused videos he was doing with Fortnite, presenting himself as this Stargate traveling messiah type figure. And then of course the, the, the tragedy happened in, in Houston where he lost control of his concert. And as a, as a consequence, I doubt that he will be brought forward as the new kind of AI human messiah, but he was clearly on that path in my opinion, when you watch those videos. And I think there's, it's not gonna be long before a totally fake cyborg being is presented as some kind of a super, super being that people will start worshiping like the Antichrist. Ah, I see. And so back mm -hmm. in the time of the Essenes, they were preparing for the arrival of a high celestial being, which may have been Jesus brought through Mother yes. Mary's virgin birth. And then right. how would that translate to now, are we awaiting the return of a high celestial being or are we becoming Christed ourselves and this is the return of Christ consciousness or maybe both? No, I, I'm, I'm gonna say both, uh, both and. Yes, indeed, uh, the Essenes were believers in reincarnation. Uh, it's widely thought among the Gnostic circles that the Cathars of Southern France were reincarnations of the Essenes. They, they lived in the uh, 13th century in, in Southern France and maintained that they, like the Essenes, possessed the original teachings of Christ. And the Cathars knew they were going to reincarnate as well. And I believe that there are many, many reincarnated Essenes and Cathars that are amongst us now. And they're seeking to remember and to reunite and to finally uh, allow their teachings to be taught on a mass scale. Whereas before they were, they were quite sequestered. Now we have the ability to put them out to the masses. Thank you for that. And so the practices that you inspire people to engage in, in order to translate into our rainbow light body are what? 
my primary contribution to this field of, of researchers and practitioners of the rainbow light body, which is a most noted as a Tibetan concept. In the rainbow light body tradition, it, we are taught that the human body was designed to have its frequency accelerated until the body dissolves into five colored rainbow light, leaving behind only hair, toe, and fingernails, which have no nerves to be transmuted, okay? Now, what I've done in my work is to say, all right, that sounds just like the resurrection of Christ. And there's many crossovers, okay? I've also matched it to the ancient Egyptian concepts of resurrection. And what I've come to conclude is that this rainbow light body teaching isn't Tibetan, it isn't Christian, and it isn't Egyptian. It's cosmic. It's like the original cosmic teaching that found its way into all these spiritual traditions. And what I've sought to do is to unite those teachings. And, and that's what I do in my presentations. And the primary modality that I use with, and, and, with, and the thread that links all three of those traditions is they all say the same thing, that the most direct way to activate your rainbow light body, your glory body, your ascension body, your resurrection body is through eye to eye, soul to soul contact with a being, be it Padmasambhava in Tibetan Buddhism, Osiris in ancient Egypt, or Christ in the Christian tradition, that through an image of this being, they can transmit to us the light, the codes, the frequencies that can activate our own rainbow light body. And what I back this up with is the neuroscience that proves this, the centuries, if not millennia of spiritual teachings that say this is the, the most direct route. And so what I do is in my presentations, I have a, a vast and really absolutely incredible collection of sacred art portraying the resurrection body or the rainbow light body, which I offer in my presentations. And also with the, the teaching that goes along with it, that the image, these images will show us the way. And I back that up, as I say, with the neuroscience and the quantum physics now that shows us how this, pos this is possible. And I encourage people that no matter what your, your modality you're practicing to lighten your frequency, be it through diet, meditation, study, physical work, whatever it is you're doing, you can complement it by beginning to incorporate what I call the art and science of, of living ascension and, and utilizing these sacred images. You do use really powerful images, especially in Ascension Keepers. And I do mm -hmm. feel transfixed when I watch your series and I've watched it a couple times now. And it's, thank you. oh, thank you for producing that because it does feel very activational. And those images mm -hmm. now feel imprinted in my brain and I have such a better understanding of I know. translating. You know, we have, we have great teachers like Dr. Joe Dispenza, who is teaching ancient principles about how to open the heart and how to connect with your future self. And that's exactly what the, the image makers of these images that I utilize would say, is that they're helping us to visualize so we can begin to rehearse and, and build those neural connections to our future self. Your, your brain looks at the image and wants to mirror what it's seeing. As you're looking at an image, for example, of Jesus bursting into light, part of you is bursting into light. But we have an editor that says, oh, chill, Suzanne, you gotta get through this interview today and then you gotta go grocery shopping after you talk with William. So, so don't turn into light while you're talking with him and looking at this image, okay? But if we could somehow nullify that editor and open up the full potential of our brain, our body already knows how to do this. It's hardwired to do it. We need the software that will activate it. And, and that's what the images start to provide is, is that software for activating our, our light body. So what I found myself over the years of engaging in meditation and Buddhist chants, mantras, mudras and even walks out in nature is that I'll find myself in a state of metamorphosis where say I'm walking out in nature and suddenly I'm aware 
that everything is vibrating at a higher frequency. And it seems like it's raining, sparkling light, and all of the colors are right. fluorescent. And I feel this profound yeah. sense of oneness. And I realize wow. this state of being I'm in right now is a higher vibrational frequency experience or even a higher dimensional experience right. than the normal, you know, 3D experience that I'm having when right. I get home and now I have to go to the grocery store. But I can take it with right. me. And as I do, yeah. it seems like I keep leveling up. And so even when I go to the grocery store after my experience, I'm more engaged and I feel more uplifted and elevated and interacting with others in a um, Absolutely. more compassionate that, way. The, yeah, I would I would liken that. That's the primordial state that the Essenes were trying to get back to. That That is the state of mind and consciousness that we're supposed to live in 24 seven. But part of what happened historically, and this is what the Essenes would teach is that it's it's our physical desires, it's our physical body that, that gets in the way of us staying in that space at all times. But it is possible. And, and this is what's so cool about what's happening now around our world is that for the very first time in history, Suzanne, we have millions and millions and millions of people that are doing yoga, that are taking those intentional walks in nature, that are experiencing this state of being. And the power of that exponentialism that that can uh, engender is what will manifest the, the flip. We can reset the reset, in other words, by many, many millions more people getting into that state. And this is the challenge where we're at right now is there's so much that's being put on us that's telling us to be fearful and, and, and uh, the media terrorizing us on a daily basis. And so part of what I would have to say is, well, how, how, do, we, how do we navigate through that? Well, we turn it off for one. Yeah. And two, we start to do the things you were just describing that put us into that elevated state and stay there. That, that is what opens up our, that angelic intelligence or ascension intelligence, as I, call it, as I uh, described it. And it's remarkable how your life starts to morph into beauty, grace, symmetry. You start to attract people into your reality that are on the same path and you find that you're occupation starts to reflect offering meditation and writing books about ascension and pretty soon you're creating this 5d life for yourself and you become less aware of what's unfolding in 3d because it's not affecting you is this how you see the bifurcation happening Yes, exactly. And that, that, again, is what is unfolding now. And it's incumbent upon all of us that are on this ascension path to begin to bring in those higher frequencies to, to flip, or as I say, reset the reset into what it is that we do want. And what we want, I believe, is to, to remain organic, natural, pure humans that with our expanded consciousness. Let's try that for a while. I mean, a few years ago, I, I used to be much angrier about it than I am now. And I'm, I'm not as angry because, as I said, I mean, there's great people like Greg Braden and others that have now picked up this message and are starting to, to get it out there. So uh, my anger was sort of born out of frustration that people weren't paying enough attention to this. OK, but now it, it's so in our face that we, we have to pay attention to it. And I, I just remembered a few years ago, there was a huge meeting in, in Davos, you know, one of those uh, World Economic Forum meetings. You had 16 of the wealthiest people on the planet. They, they represented about $2 trillion in wealth, you know, 10, 12, 15, 16 people, whatever, $2 trillion worth of wealth. And they were saying, oh, we got climate change coming in 10 years and um, we have to merge with AI to save the planet. And I'm like, really? You think so, huh? Well, how about this? And they, and they said, we need to spend a few trillion dollars on climate change in order to save the planet in the next 10 years, which is what we're doing now. And my argument then, and still would be, 
well, wait a minute, why don't we take that couple of trillion dollars, let's just cut it in half, I'll just borrow a trillion dollars from you, and we'll send everybody to a Joe Dispenza workshop for the weekend, everybody on the planet, teach them how to activate their higher consciousness, and then let's try to meditate our way through this for the next couple of years, and if that doesn't do it, then you can turn us into machines, okay? How about that? How about that? What if we try activating our organic capability, focusing on natural immunity, focus on boosting ourselves in a profound, powerful, organic way, instead of merging with technology that nobody knows what's going to happen. Do you know that, Suzanne? They're talking about, hey, we're going to link all seven, eight billion of us together in one giant mind they call the internet of bodies. We're going to link us all together. So we're going to be all one hive mind. And that'll produce what's called the, the singularity. And that AI will become smarter than all of us combined. Okay. And nobody knows what's going to happen at that moment. Elon Musk hopes the AI will maybe treat us like we treat kittens and decide to keep us as house pets. That, that's like his best case scenario for what, what they're producing right now. Why are we doing that? Why are we doing that? This is the bifurcation, and this is what has to, has to be stopped, in my opinion. We've got to put this beast back in the box and at least talk about what they're proposing, because nobody knows, and these, co these corporations, you, I know you know this, is are, are 21 steps ahead of us, okay? They're already on their booster number 18, and they know that by that time, you are full-blown AI merged, you are now totally under control. And that, that's what's facing us, and, unless we can take the steps now to, to slow that down. And so do you believe that if enough of the spiritual community around the world comes together and creates unity communities that we can co-create a new earth and vibe out of this 3D spectrum of we perception? We can, and that, that is the challenge of our times. And we don't wanna fail. We don't wanna look at the Essenes and the Cathars and all that have come before us and say, ah, you know, we were just too busy. We, yeah, we didn't get it done. That failure is not an option <laughs> in this case here. Failure is not an option. Right. And in my view, um, where I think we need to focus our effort is one of the things that the big tech and these, these people are seeking to do is not only to redefine the meaning of the word soul, and also this idea that your soul can be cut, copied, and pasted into a robot or an avatar, cartoon avatar online, and it's still you. That, that's one of their, their aims. But their other aim is also to say, you know, Suzanne, you never were real to begin with, darling. You live in a simulated reality. And this is just a video game. And there is, you have no existence outside this game. This is what they're teaching children right now. It's even more dangerous than anything that's being taught in the schools now is this belief that all of this is just a fake simulated reality and it doesn't really matter what you do, okay? This is the belief that is driving Elon Musk and every single big tech company subscribes to this, this idea. So does the US military, okay? They believe all of this is just a video game. And what spiritual people have to say is, excuse me, uh, but there is a heaven. There is a pure land that the Buddhists described. There is a base reality outside of this reality, this matrix that we are in. And you are not going to convince me that I am a nothing being, that I don't matter, that this is just a video game. I'm, I'm not going to listen to that nonsense that you're spouting. Instead, I'm going to focus my effort on proving the existence of that life after life the pure land of Buddhism. I'm gonna connect with the avatars and beings who dwell in those higher frequency realms. And I'm going to bring them into this realm and show that demonstrably in my own life that, this, there, that there is a reality beyond this one. So I know that that sounds maybe sci-fi, sounds a little heavy, but again, I've been researching this and studying these people for 20 years. I, I can get in their head. 
And this is what they are, this is what they believe. And this is why I say this is where the real battle is in, in this in, in this quote unquote war we're having uh, with the big tech companies, with this, with these tyrannical authoritarian organizations and governments. That, that this is what they believe. And we have to come back at it from a spiritual perspective and proving the existence of the base reality beyond this one is the, the, our, our key mission right now. Uh, Robert Bigelow, uh, the National In Institute of Discovery Science. He, he went on the uh, Skinwalker Ranch and is, is a billionaire. He just recently gave out a, a million dollar prize to Jeffrey Mishlove for his paper uh, talking about the proof of the afterlife. So, so that is a, an example of a step in that direction where scientists, philosophers, spiritual people are beginning to say, hey, wait a minute. Yeah, we have got to hit this with some very powerful information right now. Near-death experiences, I think, are the yeah. proof that our soul goes on. And there's so many of them now who are right. you know, having these NDEs and coming back and telling about their experience on the other side. And I myself have witnessed my mother-in-law and my father both pass, and I saw them go in and out of their body, and it wow. was remarkable to experience, you know, that transition. Um, I was going to ask a couple of more questions. One, when we talk about this sort of virtuality, I do get this sense that since we are in a holographic universe, that there may be a virtuality of our eternal souls at the center of our creation, in a sense, projecting holographic fractals of its personality into these different timelines and dimensions. Right. And so in a sense, right. it may seem that this eternal soul is sort of playing this virtual reality game with its avatars. But the difference is that it's a streaming consciousness from our eternal soul who is sourced by the infinite and also immortal. And so that we know that even if we are here in this holographic reality, we are streaming consciousness from our source self or our eternal soul right. who is immortal right. and divine. Right. Right. And, and I, of course, go along with everything you just said, but just want to emphasize that we don't live in a, in a holographic reality, in my view. We live in a reality that is like a holographic reality. I mean, that is a current era technology that we're using to describe what we see around us. And the key point is of, of emphasis is also that to not lose sight that there is a base reality outside of this reality that, that does behave like a holographic reality. And, and that, again, is the, is, is the key point that I keep trying to emphasize is that that's where we have to put our, our effort is in connecting with that realm. It's intermingled with us, according to the Egyptians, according to the Tibetans. Christian teaching says the same thing. Plato talked about this, this concept. So it's nothing new. It, it runs parallel with the whole idea of ascension, because once again, part of the, the question about ascension is, where are you going? And how are you going to get there? Um, like, for example, uh, what you described earlier about that really heightened state of ecstasy. That, that you could enter into in, in your waking state. Yeah, that that's, sounds very much like the Garden of Eden to me. That, as I said, that's our primordial state. And so that's an identifiable kind of layer or frequency. And what we've got to do is match up our experience with what the ancients described about, about the, the continuing geography of, of those higher realms. I mean, today you use the word 5D. I don't uh, I, I think people use that a lot. That's a good term because they don't want to, sometimes they don't want to recognize that ascension is a Christian concept, right? That the new heaven and new earth is, that's Christian, that's Christianity. So we, we put new labels on it, but it means the same thing as the new heaven and new earth of, of Christianity. So I think it's really important that when we talk about some of these terms, we're able to find their source, 
and then match them to the originators of that concept, because in my view, that's going to get us closer to the purest teaching um, about this concept. And so the new Jerusalem being the new earth that we have the opportunity to ascend into. And is that a global concept of the new Jerusalem is the new earth? Yes, yes. And that's, again, John in Revelation, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And again, this is where the mocking and mimicking come in, comes in because your virtual reality people say, yeah, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. All you got to do is put on your virtual reality goggles and you're there, baby, right? And then ultimately your, your whole physical body will, will enter into it, not just through the glasses. But this is the, the idea is that this new heaven is already intermingled amongst us. And what we've got to do is rise up a bit more to, to meet it and it will be fully revealed all around us. Beautiful. Not to dive back into the darkness, but just for my education and the viewers, it feels like history is repeating itself. And as you said, many of the people who are inspired by the awakening and ascension movement now and or leaders in it, maybe reincarnated as scenes in Cathars are also the Roman emperors of the ancient past who engaged in mass extinction events of the spiritual peoples of that time have also reincarnated? And what does the Roman emperor of the ancient Roman empire of the ancient past have to do with what we're experiencing here and now? Well, um, I, I, I kind of am guessing from your question that you're aware that Mark Zuckerberg of, of Facebook and now Meta thinks he's the reincarnation of Julius Caesar? I did not know that. No, I did not know that. Yeah. Whoa, wow. <laughs> On his honeymoon, uh, his wife says on their honeymoon, they went to Rome and she's like, it was me, Mark and Julius Caesar. He's obsessed with Caesar. And in his own words, he doesn't say I am Julius Caesar, but he clearly is modeling himself after him right down to his haircut. That's why he's got that Caesar haircut is because he and acknowledges that he has this obsession with, with Caesar. So he, he behaves like a Caesar right? Authoritarian, tyrannical, dict dictatorial, and hated by many, many people, right? I'm sad to say, I'm sure he's a nice guy, but what he's doing is, is Caesar would be applauding it. And he's not the only one. Uh, Donald Trump was widely acknowledged as Cyrus the Great by Jewish rabbis. Cyrus the Great is the Persian emperor who freed the Jews from their slavery in Babylon, from their exile in Babylon. So there's two examples of people that are acknowledged by different sources as being reincarnations of individuals. I, back in the early 90s, I used to follow Saddam Hussein around because he believed that he was the reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar, the, the biblical king who destroyed uh, Solomon's temple and, and took the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And so it's, it's very fascinating when you start looking at some of the players on the world stage today and listen to what they say and uh, entertain the possibility that it could be that they are these, these reincarnated, reincarnated figures. Um, and like example, in the example of Donald Trump and King Cyrus uh, in, in uh, Jerusalem, they minted coins with their, their images side by side saying this, Donald Trump is Cyrus. And they were looking at him as a sort of a messianic figure who uh, most certainly was ticking some boxes in terms of prophecy uh, during his administration. So uh, who's next? Who, who else is going to be revealed as a, a, an important figure from the past, be of the light or of the dark? Well, we'll have to see. But it's very clear that they're out there. And uh, as your question suggested, so are the Essenes and Cathars. And it's time to come together. It's time to reignite the mission and be our play play our role in this battle as the Essenes called it between the children of light and the children of darkness and what's at stake is the future of all humanity it's, it's it doesn't get any bigger than that tune in to more of william henry's phenomenal insights and the extensive library 
of books and materials that he shares on his website, WilliamHenry.net. Thank you so much for connecting the ancient stories of ascension in the past to the modern day opportunity to ascend into our rainbow light body and your latest book, The Skingularity is Near, The Next Human Rainbow Light Body and the Technology of Human Transcendence. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> Great, well, thank you Suzanne so much. I'm looking forward to uh, being with everyone in Sedona in March. Yes, we're very much looking forward to having you as well. And so just go ahead and visit SedonaAscensionRetreats.com and we'll look forward to seeing you in Sedona. Thanks so much, William Henry. I so appreciate it. Thank you. Be sure to register before December 1st for your early bird discount. <laughs>